So our speakers here are uh, Greg Sharfstein of Seal Storage. We have Stu Berman of Picnic. And we have Brian Bellendorf again, actually, who is a Filecoin Foundation board member. So thanks for the double duty, Brian. And this will be facilitated by our own Clara Tsao of the Filecoin Foundation. So um, we will let Clara take it away here. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We have plenty of seats in the front, and so if you guys want to sit and listen to this session, feel free to come into the room. Um, I'm so excited to talk about a really important topic. How do we get to the next 10 gigabytes of data? For those that are not aware, the internet today is close to one exabyte of data, and we have, as we mentioned before, um, of over 70 exabytes of available storage. Um, today on the Filecoin network. And we have so much more that everyone on this panel is working on, from Gregory and Stu, from each of their storage provider companies, as well as Brian, who we just heard from. We talked about quantum computing and some of the barriers to Next Frontier. So I thought maybe um, starting with Gregory, we can go through and just do a quick introduction about your background. Uh, sure, thanks. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me out. Um, so um, I am not much of a blockchain person until recently. Um, I'm actually a degreed mechanical engineer, and I've been spending the last 20 years building scientific instruments. So I'm very well networked into the scientific community, the academic community. And the way that I got into seal storage is um, um, I'll skip the first 15 years of, of my career. I, um, I ended up at Berkeley Lab in Northern California, um, back as a mechanical engineer. And uh, I still had this entrepreneurial itch. And so uh, I started taking some courses called i -Core. This is uh, the DOE's version of the Lean Startup. So this is customer discovery. This is value propositions, uh, customer segments. And I really um, enjoyed that work. And as I learned about SEAL and the work that I've been doing the last six months, I've realized I've been training for this for five years without realizing it. And so when I got to SEAL uh, in October, it was just classic customer discovery. Uh, one on one, I was really focusing on customer segments, who am I talking to, value propositions, what am I saying to those people. And um, as I got into it, I, I really learned that the, the, the uh, scientific community is very excited about new technology. Their data is extremely important to this community. And I came across a lot of folks that, as I say, have been working with petabytes for decades, right? And imagine having a petabyte in 2000, right? H hard drives were about 10 gigabytes back then. You probably had to have your own data center. You really didn't like that, so you were a physicist and an IT professional. Uh, and then the cloud came around, around 08, 09, and now you went off to, to the cloud and you realize, wow, I just lost control of my data. Um, and so a lot of these folks, they're hungry for new technology. They're hungry. They've heard about Web3, and then they see someone like me come across and put an offer on the table to try something new, and they really want to give it a spin. And so we've had a lot of success in the scientific community, really large data sets, people that really care about their data, and, and they understand that the uh, solution, because this is a very young ecosystem, is gonna have some duct tape on it. And they're kind of happy about that, because they want to get in the trenches with us, they want to build, they want to develop, and that's part of, the, um, you know, part of the traction that we're seeing in the space. Wonderful, thank you so much, Gregory. Next up, we have Stu. Stu is actually an early participant in the MinorX program for Filecoin. Um, Stu, you also learned about how to become a Filecoin storage provider through your son, right? Or early yeah. days of, of your involvement in the blockchain. He got me involved in crypto mining, so uh, I'm teaching him about Filecoin. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, we were involved, a bunch of us at Picnic, we're a storage provider um, based in North America, and we got involved before there, were, there was any data on the Filecoin network, right? So we've watched the amount of data just explode over the last couple of years. So we've lived it, we've breathed it, we understand it. Um, prior to my life with Filecoin, uh, I was in enterprise uh, IT space. So I spent decades working, uh, working with large companies, uh, security architect primarily, but also network engineering. And uh, I really understand uh, how companies, how large enterprises look at sharing data, what they're willing to do, what they need to, you know, what they need to do, the kind of trust that they're expecting, the kind of contracts they're expecting in order to entrust others with their data. 
Wonderful. And you guys have heard from Brian just earlier, but Brian did not embellish on his background. Brian, you've worked across so many different sectors from civic tech um, to work with the WEF to the Pachi Foundation, early open source communities. Would love to hear you expand a little bit more on those and how those previous experiences really matter around us thinking about the next 10 gigabytes. Sure. Um, well, it, it's predominantly been a career focused on open source software. Um, I'm really bad at figuring out how to keep things to myself or build proprietary kind of like moats around anything. I'm really good at figuring out how do we make things digital public goods, right? So uh, I've been on the board of the Mozilla Foundation since 2003. Before that, played a role in co-founding the Apache Software Foundation. Did start a few companies where I left like the business side up to other people, sometimes with success, sometimes not. Uh, but then. I uh, worked in the White House 2009 and 10 and was CTO at the WEF. And in almost uh, all of that kind of like, uh, bo both uh, in government, uh, at the World Economic Forum, at other places, one of the biggest challenges to getting better digital engagement and, and helping people really understand the ground truth of what's going on in the world is coming down to data. And not just putting up a zip file uh, on a web server somewhere, letting people download it, but data that can be trusted, data that has integrity to it, data that you know the next government administration can't just suddenly change all the temperature values to be five degrees lower uh, across the board and then without really anybody noticing going, oh, well, there's no global warming problem. What are you talking about, right? So I, I actually wrote during the uh, Obama uh, campaign in 2008 where I was a, a tech advisor, a strategy for uh, uh, data.gov, which then was implemented again as kind of a dumb, here's a, a, a CSV file on a website. But what I called for was something that was a lot more like GitHub. Here's the data, uh, here's uh, uh, the versioning that goes on in data, because anyone who's worked with data knows, you go through cleanup, you go through rationalization, you align things based on, because you collect it in different ways over the course of time, and you want metadata associated with it too. What, what was the conditions of how it was collected? Where did you throw away data that didn't seem to make sense, which sometimes you want, sometimes not? And how do you build a community around each data set? So that kind of integrity and the sociability around data is something that still is missing from so much of the civic data sets out there. Um, and now we're talking about companies having interesting data from a climate point of view, uh, from a human rights point of view, from an ESG point of view. Everybody wants to, to look good on their different uh, environmental and sustainability kind of metrics and because there's now investors who base their investment decisions on that kind of thing. So we're in a world now where there's a much higher premium placed on not just of having large data sets available and pooling that data in a very public way with a bit of governance over how it's created, of course, uh, and having to respect PII and, and trust and safety, I'm sure a topic we'll get into and others, um, but also using that as the, uh, that, that trust and integrity is the basis for uh, government policy, uh, industrial policy, going off and building new kinds of businesses. And I, frankly, I got involved in this community after having been a skeptic for a long time of all things you know, crypto and blockchain, um, partly because I could see that there is real signal coming from, real, real value in what uh, has been created here. And getting to know Juan very early on, getting to know the crew at Protocol Labs, getting to know uh, Clara Yu and Megan and everybody that's come together in the foundation. These are people really committed to uh, uh, building the next layer of storage on the internet uh, and figuring out how to, how to keep some small players from owning how we store things on the internet, which is kind of the situation we have today. Um, moving away from that, getting to something much more decentralized and having a sustainability model for it. That's why it's not just IPFS, but also about the, the payments and incentives layer on top, which is what Filecoin brings. And so I've just been really happy to be involved in this and see it completely linearly consistent with where I've been. Wonderful. Well, on the topic of trust, Brian, I think you transitioned us to the first question for this panel, is how do we actually build trust, right? We saw early on with IPFS, we backed up a copy of Wikipedia in Turkey when the government took down all the information. So there's a lot of opportunity for information integrity. But I would love to hear all of you guys expand on issues with trust. Um, what is already not trusted information in Web 2? Where is the frontier for Web 3? How is this creating bottlenecks for you, Greg and Stu, for how you guys are thinking about enterprise data adoption among your client side? So maybe, Brian, we'll start with you and then work our way down that way. Well, I think I said a lot of it. I mean, it's even down to the fact that you, you know IPFS and obviously then Filecoin is based on content address storage. And for those of you who've lived with URLs and lived with 
you know, 404 not founds and, and lived with the fact that the same web page can change silently behind you. The idea of content address, address storage is a fundamentally different paradigm and is how you get to knowing that that data that I saw last week or three years ago at that address is the same as it is today. It's the basis for censorship resistance. It's the basis for a whole lot of, no, you know, just without having to store everything in one massive blockchain itself, you know, in a very decentralized way, still knowing that you get, you're getting what you think you should be getting and expect to be getting. Um, it's just a very powerful concept, and it makes us all look like freaks when we try to explain it to people who don't get it. But um, once you're there, you see that as the key to a lot of that trust. Obviously, the second part of that it just comes from uh, how much, how, how massive it is. If there were three of us running the Filecoin network or three of us running IPFS, um, there wouldn't be that inherent trust. But the fact that there is already uh, 10 exabytes, right? And we're talking here about the next 10, and we'd really like 100 more. Uh, I mean, that's, that, 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 that standardization is really what I think we really want to get to. How does this become the next layer for not just like Amazon Glacier but the next, uh, and the replacement for that, but maybe S3, maybe even CDNs like Cloudflare and, and Akamai. I don't mean to put anybody on notice and suddenly create a lot of new antibodies for what we're doing, but um, uh, that's the kind of, I think, revolution that we could have through this. So yeah, and at the basis of it is trust. Yeah, Stu, over to you. What are some opportunities you see with the work you're doing with Picnic, but also some of the challenges that you know, we have to overcome as an ecosystem at the same time? Sure. So um, one of the things that's really intriguing about you know, blockchain and, uh, and Filecoin is this concept of the trustless network. And of course, it's really kind of confounding. You're like, so I shouldn't trust this? It's like, no, no, that's not what that means, right? It's not that you don't trust the network. It's that you don't have to trust somebody. Right? You know, it's not like, well, Brian said it's good, so trust me, you know, you can, you can deal with them. You really have to end up trusting the algorithm, right? It's, it's the fact that there's something we can all inspect, and we all know that it's going to function the way it's designed to function, because it's open, and it's the algorithm that makes these decisions, rather than some person at some hyperscale that says, don't worry, we protect our systems, we won't let people touch or mangle your data. Uh, so when it comes to, like, enterprise data sources, large data sources, even not large nonprofits, what we're seeing is they're very concerned that um, who is going to be able to alter or access this data if we don't want it to be public, right? If we, we like when we work with the Shoah Foundation, they have video testimony from the Holocaust and they've made agreements with some of the survivors who delivered this video testimony that they would not make this public until so many years after they passed away. So they trust that this data will be kept confidential until it's ready to be released. So, you know, with different agencies, we have different approaches to how we engender trust. Typically in an enterprise, you know, you have a, a contract, you have a, um, uh, SLAs, you know, you have these formal legal ways, but at the end of the day, you still have to probably deal with their CISO or their, their legal department about, well, how are you gonna really assure of this to me, assure me that this will be so? You can use standards like uh, SOC 2 and NIST and ISO that shows that you have your ducks in a row, but ultimately you're really still trusting in people. And we show you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about some clerk accidentally giving or leaving something or opening up an email with some malware in it and oops, all your, system, you know, your data got exposed in a way that you least expected. Unfortunately, we hear about this in the news all too often. No, absolutely. And, and Gregory, um, same question to you, but also wanted to hear about your thoughts also on competition. What are the biggest competitors in this space right now um, for decentralized storage? How is trust impacting that? And also, um, wanted to queue up a preview that Seal is doing an exciting announcement over at the cafe stage in just 45 minutes from now. So definitely walk over there in a bit to hear about a really exciting partnership with a major university. So, Greg, over to you. Uh, thanks. Um, so um, I look at trust in a little different way. Um, I'm, I'm on the tip of the spear of the sales spear, and so I, I, I see it like relationships and timing, right? So um, it's my job to build these relationships with these uh, academic institutions, and as I mentioned before, the timing is right, right? These folks that have large data sets, they're ready to try something new. And my main goal is to find those technical people and I want to bring that entire team to meet my technical team. One of the things that I'm really proud about SEAL is we have an, a phenomenal technical team. And one of the really fun things that I get to do, especially on Zoom nowadays, so we'll have like 15 people on a call, 
and I can watch everyone's reaction at the same time when they ask a technical question about privacy, about accessibility, about security, and then one of our one of our, our, our team members gives a really nice answer, and I can see all these heads nodding at the same time, and I can almost see the tension like being relieved on their shoulders as they're learning and as they're kind of digging deeper technically into what we can offer. And, um, and so I, I think that's really important is, is it's not just some really quick, hey, you should try this, okay, we're gonna try it. It's more of a, it's a long process, right? That's why this work is really hard, because it takes months, it takes many conversations, it, it takes lots of times going back and giving more responses and, and, and digging deeper. I find the uh, Filecoin white paper is a phenomenal thing to send around that gives anyone a real deep dive on what's going on under the hood, because they all want to know. Um, and then as far as like competition goes, one thing that I do when I'm first establishing these relationships is I like to take the compare us to you know, a Google Cloud or an Amazon Cloud. I take it off the table right away. But this is not fair. We are a very young ecosystem. That is an extremely mature ecosystem with enormous companies you know, governing um, everything. And the main difference that I see and a lot of our customers are seeing is, right, so in the Amazon world, yes, it's, it costs money for, to, to store my data, but they make their money on my access to my own data, which when I learned that, I'm very unhappy about that. In Filecoin, the data itself and its continual storage has value to the network. That's a whole different mindset. And once these folks see that, like, wow, my data has value, oh, that's awesome, because they've never really heard that. It's always been kind of like a boat anchor, right? When they had their own data sets, they had their own petabytes, and they were, you know, trying to build you know, uh, uh, their own data centers. And they, they, they went to the cloud, they learned the cloud didn't value their, um, uh, their data. So now we're coming to them and saying, no, your data has value. Let's use your large data sets to unlock, de um, uh, to unlock development resources. And then let's all get in the sandbox and play together. And that model seems to work really well. Can I say one more thing on trust? Yeah, absolutely. Just feel free to jump in here. Yeah, no, I mean, one of the big trends in cybersecurity, which is the domain I work in more, has been zero trust, right? Trying to assume that everybody on the network is hostile. And it's actually a term that I, I really despise because it is about trust in process rather than trust in people, which is like the basis for the rule of law in modern democracies anyways, right? Uh, and I think, uh, actually, Cory Doctorow nailed it pretty well. He's often been a critic of the blockchain space, cryptocurrency space, but he wrote an essay recently uh, where he really, he came to this realization the Web3 community is about subsidiarity, right? It's about we can build these cooperative networks, uh, but still have the, the right to fork, still have the freedom to be able to operate locally and, and, and engage and have a permissionless kind of way of engaging with that network. So, I mean, Corey writes a ton of great stuff. I'm sure you, some of you follow him, but it's like he finally got what Web3 and blockchain is about. And then I think the storage layer of that is such a critical piece of that story. So um, I'm hoping next year I can interview him on stage and, and have that conversation then. No, that would be amazing. So Corey, if you're listening to this recording, Brian's gonna ask you to join him on stage in the next Phil event we have around the world. Um, we're just gonna put that out there for the recording. Um, I did also wanna expand around trust and safety. I know Brian, you had raised this earlier, but trust is really a trade-off, right? We're talking about more security, more decentralization, but the trade-off is, at the end of the day, there will be bad actors in every version of the internet, web one, web two, web three, web four, and they're gonna find, figure out ways to really manipulate the system um, to their own malicious goals. I think what's really exciting for me about the Web3 community is what Brian said earlier about his work with open source. Everyone works together as a community. Everyone cares about the healthiness of the data, the healthiness of building a trusted network, and so storage providers like Picnic and Seal are very much in the fight with us to make sure that we have the right tooling, to make sure there isn't child pornography or other negative stuff there, and really making sure that we can, we can keep data storage secure, trusted, but also keep all the terrible stuff out of it as well so that we can really think about archival and uh, decentralized storage in a, in a positive way that moves the internet forward. I would love to hear from you. I know this was not actually in the questions um, I shared previously, but what are your dream data sets? What is something that would be a dream for the next 10 million gigabytes for each of you? You know, just a wish list of people you want to work with, data you want to see onboarded. What's on that list? So at a, at a personal level, I'm, I'm astounded by the fact that um, if I need to understand something about my medical history, I have to ask my mother 
because all the records over all the many different physicians, the doctors I've used over the years, who knows where they are, if they even exist anymore. So what if I can control all my medical data? It's not in the control of a physician's office or a hospital or you know, the government or whoever, but I can give access and we could allow people to put any of the data they want to put on, on the network so that they control this, right? And they, they don't lose track of something that important. So that's just a little dream that I have, but uh, that one that keeps coming to mind. No, I think that's so, that's so important. I think the entire state of Maine, they lost all their citizen data at some point that people couldn't access for, for medical data, for court records. Those are the devastating parts of, of losing data. What about you, Gregory or Brian? Any wish lists? Oh, yeah. Um, sets? Uh, certainly. Um, with my mechanical engineering background, I've had the luxury um, or honor, really, of working on some major projects like the James Webb Space Telescope. And I just love engineering for the purpose of discovery and science. And so I see the work that we're doing here is putting that data out to the world and really getting it into every corner of the world. And a dream of mine would be that we severely accelerate you know, the progress of science just because we're distributing data around the world and more people have access, more people can, you know, can pull data off, work on it, put it back up, and then we can learn a lot faster. So that's my dream. Great, Brian, over to you. I have two. Um, you know, modern satellite and, and even like high altitude plane uh, mapping of uh, service has gotten really good, right? From satellite, you now can see down to about a half meter resolution, I think even uh, sub 0.3 meter resolution. Um, uh, and what we should be doing is asking those companies to scan war zones, such as uh, the Ukraine uh, or other places where human rights abuses might be uh, occurring, uh, scan those once a day, multiple times a day if possible, and store that forever. Uh, because when you go into a place like Buka in, in the Ukraine, knowing that those black splotches on that road might have been bodies that had been left by the occupiers, I think is critical to holding occupiers accountable for the war crimes that they commit. So that would be one, one dream data set would be, I know it's rather dark, but like, like we need that data to be able to hold people to account, uh, hold countries to account when they, when they commit atrocities like this. The second, um, so there's a, a wave of companies now that have sensors that can detect uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, down to some pretty fine grain levels as well. Kairos Aerospace is one of those. Um, and it's, it's a new kind of camera that they put on um, uh, small uh, planes that they fly over to look at like in this, uh, um, say this, uh, 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 you know, like a oil refinery, where might there be some methane leaks coming or carbon dioxide leaks? I, actually, I think it's methane. I don't know if they do carbon dioxide yet. I would love to see a data set that was methane emissions, and if they can do it, carbon dioxide emissions over major metropolitan and industrial areas, again, once a day, so we can start to get to real world accounting for where the carbon in the atmosphere is coming from. Because we think it's coming from tailpipes, we think it's coming from people who report it out of their smokestacks, but I bet a whole lot of it is coming out of old wells that haven't been capped, uh, leaky infrastructure in other places, and we're not going to get to, to keeping a lid on global warming unless we can really fine grain know where those emissions are happening and keep that tight. So those would be my two dream data sets. Well, that's so incredible to hear. I think we're very much on our way to those dreams coming together sooner than later. Um, as you guys may have heard earlier, Filecoin right now represents 1% of all s sold storage capacity over the last year in 2021. We can't wait to actually grow even higher numbers next year and the years to come. And so thank you so much for joining us today. The panelists will be available throughout the rest of the day, so feel free to ask them for questions, but thank you.